Welcome to Bogleheads on Investing, episode number nine. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Dr. Wesley Ray, CEO of Alpha Architect, where he and his colleagues are breaking new ground, and the author of three books on quantitative investing. Hi, everyone. My name is Rick Ferry, and this is Bogleheads on Investing. This episode is sponsored by the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a 501c3 corporation. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Wesley Gray. After serving in the United States Marine Corps, Dr. Gray earned an MBA and a PhD in finance from the University of Chicago, where he studied under Nobel Prize winner Eugene Fama. He then took a job in academia before starting his investment management company, where he is on the cutting edge of new insights into factor investing. With no further ado, let's bring in Dr. Wesley Gray. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great, Rick. Appreciate you bringing me on. You very much impressed me the very first time I I learned about you and I talked with you. The stuff you're working on is cutting edge. I really believe that you are the new Jedi out there in the quant world. Before we get into what you're currently doing now, Mm -hmm. I want to start at the beginning. Where did you go to your undergraduate degree? I went to undergrad at University of Pennsylvania at uh, at the Wharton School. So I kind of started off with, you know, the uber finance geek undergrad. And my kind of my first way I parlayed myself into academic research is I walked into this gentleman's office named Chris Gatesy, who who now writes a lot of papers on the 200-year history of momentum or relative strength or value or what have you. And I just said, I love this stuff. Can you teach me how to be a professor? And he basically said, hey, see that shelf right there? Grab these 10 books and read them and come back in two weeks and let's talk. That was my initial start into geeking out and getting into uh, academic research and moving along my initial path, which was to be a finance professor. But there was also another side to you. You had this idea that perhaps you could figure out ways of outperforming the market. Well, yeah, kind of. And simultaneous to the sign I want to be a finance professor, I was also trading my own money, doing a lot of investing. I was there from 98 to 2002. And so that was obviously during the internet bubble. And so I had this exposure where I'd come off you know, reading every book, everything I could get my hands on related to Ben Graham and Warren Buffett and the value investment philosophy, you know, pets.com's going up a thousand percent a day. You know, my dad's telling me to go buy the Janus global tech fund. And, and (laughs) I'm sitting here, like I'm a, I'm a value by nature person and I'm watching these markets thinking they're crazy. And I'm obviously trading in value names getting destroyed. But then on the other side of my life, I'm like, Hey, I just intellectually like this. And, you know, I, I was like, Hey, I should, I want to stay this forever. So it was kind of a weird barbell in the sense that I was, you know, sitting there trading stocks. And then on the other hand, I was reading, you know, stochastic calculus books, uh, just trying to get baseline, you know, essentially to be a research assistant for Gatesy. And so what happened is I kept doing all the investment stuff, kept doing my stock picking. And then, you know, I started, essentially I became for the Wharton finance department, the, I guess, I I don't want to use the, the computer monkey. I was like the data monkey. So if someone needed to have a, something coded up in MATLAB, that was my job. So like I I kind of, kind of became like a little mini, uh, you know, workhorse for the department, you know, so like fast forward a couple of years, and, you know, I was saying all these guys are also, by the way, Chicago PhDs, because for whatever reason, Chicago tends to feed, you know, the Wharton faculty. And Chris Gates is like, hey, you're, you're going to apply to Chicago. It, and that's it. I was like, well, aren't there other schools? Like, should I consider other PhD programs? They're like, no, you got to go to Chicago. They're, they're like, we'll get you in. And I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> how does that work? They're like, hey, take all your tests and do all your stuff. And it will write your recommendations letters. And then, so sure enough, you know, I, I applied to University of Chicago PhD program just straight out of undergrad, which is also not normal because typically you go get a master's or what have you. But I, I had a lot of, you know, kind of close holds in the department that were writing letters for me 
and PhD programs, they only accept, you know, a handful of people every year. So it's a much more kind of one-off deal. It's not like applying to an MBA program. Long story short, I got in. I was like, wow, I guess I'm going to actually do this. Since you entered the program in 2002, the Chicago school at the time, and it still is to a certain extent, it's just, we're going to take you in and we're just going to beat you up. Like you are going to get destroyed in, in problem sets, workload, and let's just see if you survive. And so, you know, first two years are just, you know, literally I was studying like 15 hours a day, seven days a week, just trying to stay above water. Because I, I came in obviously without having a lot of experience or grad school or what have you. So it was, it was actually, say, pretty difficult, uh, but I made it. And and so after the, the first two years there, I I don't say I was burned out, but I was 24. I'd been slaving away doing quant academic geek stuff forever. And I just thought, hey, I need to maybe take a break or do something else. So you you really did do something else. I would say that what you did was quite radical. And of course, I'm proud of you for it. So what I did is I decided I was going to join the Marine Corps, which you're an alumnus of. And it certainly seems radical, but what was super interesting at the time is I would say a good 20 to 30 percent of the Chicago finance PhD program were actually former military officers, a lot of them from Israel or, or Finland or what have you. So they were all like, oh, yeah, of course you should do that. Whereas many people on the outside are like, well, you must be the first time anyone's ever done that. But it was super interesting is inside the program, like the, my other fellow PhD mates were like, hey, that's, that's pretty cool. And so, yeah, I went down to Professor Fama and at the time, Professor Thaler, who, which is crazy, I had these <laughs> two Nobel Prize winners were, were actually like at the, you know, it wasn't my dissertation, but our, my curriculum paper advisors. And I just had to ask them permission to get a four-year sabbatical and Professor Fama was actually like super cool about it. He's just like, oh, that's awesome. Like proud of you. Yeah, happy to sign. You know, didn't even think twice about it. And then your Professor Thaler, he was more curious. He was definitely like, you're going to do what? Uh, but eventually I got both those gentlemen to sign off and then submitted it to the PhD program coordinator and took a four-year sabbatical. That's amazing that you could actually do that. Take four years off. Well, you, so you can't. You, you can take technically one year off. And so that's the reason I had to go and have them sign off on this special kind of extended sabbatical because it was a unique circumstance where most people don't go on sabbatical to do service. The PC program director kind of agreed like, hey, this is a unique circumstance. As long as you get your you know, advisors to sign off on it, we're cool with it. And, and so I had to do a few extra hoops to jump through to actually make it happen. Well, that's great. And then you went down to Quantico and went through Officer Candidate School? Yep. So then I went to OCS, which is Officer Candidate School, then went to TBS, the basic school, and then my MOS was a ground intelligence officer. You go through the infantry officer course, you, you kind of do everything that the infantry officers do, and then they go uh, pick up their platoons, whereas ground intelligence officers then go down to damn neck and do another six months of intelligence officer training and then you go hit the fleet so it's the longest pipeline besides you know helo and and fixed wing people but it, you know it's about a year and a half almost two years of training pipeline and from there they shipped you off to okinawa i went right to okinawa and then right when i was in okinawa they sent me down uh to one of the islands in in japan and you know did a bunch of like joint training missions with them Spent about a month there, and then I got sent directly down to the Philippines. And, and at the time, this was, I think, was that 2004, 2005, that we were, there was a bunch of uh, activity going, going on in this island called Holo, uh, which is a bunch of Muslim extremists and what have you. But then there was this thing called the Leyte mudslide disaster and a coup. So I, I started in the Philippines, you know, going crazy for a couple months there. And then, then right when I got back to Okinawa, which... I was assigned there, but I rarely ever hung out there for like maybe a day or two. Uh, the colonel calls me in the office and he basically says, hey, you're, you're going to Hawaii. And I was like, 
all right, what, uh, <laughs> why am I going to Hawaii? Like, they're like, oh, you're on a MIT team, uh, a military uh, transition training team, and, and you're going to get deployed to Iraq. So then, you know, then I went out to Hawaii, did a big workup, and then, yeah, then we deployed out. I was on one of the training teams where you're in bed with Iraqis and try to help them avoid uh, shooting themselves in the foot. In fact, you wrote an entire book about your experience working with the Iraqis. The the name of the book was called Embedded, and it was a fascinating insight into what was going on. Yeah, so I kind of went in uh, to the service. I, I didn't join the service because I wanted to go to war, per se. I just you know, I just wanted to do my time. But I was certainly under the belief when, I don't know if you probably remember, but Colin Powell like, showed that little powder of that white powder and said, hey, we're all going to die. Kind of believe that. I was like, all right, we, we, need, we need to probably do something here. Fast forward, now, now I'm actually deployed, living in an Iraqi battalion, training up these Iraqi soldiers to, you know, kind of take over their defense duties. And, and I really got an opportunity to, you know, actually live with these people, eat with these people, talk with these people, and kind of get a better insight to the culture and, and kind of how they operate. And that experience honestly just floored me. And I, I took a whole 180 where I, I said, I don't know what we're doing here. This is crazy. Like, I was not expecting this. These people are tribal. They're totally different. Like, the, what we're trying to achieve here it does, does not jive at all with their society. I need to tell the story because there's probably a lot of guys like me that, you know, rah, rah, let's go to war in you know, they don't realize it. So, so that I just got inspired. I was like, I got to share the story. So I had to just write a whole book basically about my time being embedded with the, you know, Iraqis and just trying to explain like their cultural nuance and why what we were trying to do, like, you know, bring freedom and democracy to their society just seemed like a, you know, maybe it wasn't a great idea. That, that's pretty much what that, that book was about. Just sharing my experiences there, which were, you know, highly enlightening to me. And I just I wanted to make sure other people got to at least experience it through at least my book, uh, even if they can't be there themselves. I understand that you speak Arabic and that you taught yourself. I did. So, I mean, I could probably converse in it if, if I got warmed up. But uh, yeah, I, so I was the intelligence officer. And the more I read beforehand, because I knew we were going to war in these areas, the like, you know, speaking Arabic, Arabic, like the actual language there is a means a heck of a lot more because it's associated with the religion, you know, because it's, you know, from Allah. So, you know, it's kind of a big deal. So the more if you want to win in those sort of culture wars, you got to really, you know, establish bonds with the people you're working with. And so learning the language is, is I thought was a main effort. So, yeah, I just put a ton of time up front to train extremely hard, you know, both on learn how to kill people and everything, but also how to learn this language. And then when I got there, I just forced myself to literally embed with the people and not use a terp. And then, you know, if you sit there long enough and get tired of using hand signals and not understand each other, um, you know, eventually you can start maneuvering. So yeah, I got to a point where I actually served as a terp for our team and we would go out on convoys and I would be the terp you know, to, to interface between our team and the Iraqis. Um, yes, and, and, I, and I definitely highly recommend if, if anyone, you know, has to do that mission ever again to spend way more time learning the language and a lot less on, you know, tactics per se, because it gives you a lot more, I'd say, with, what the Iraqis call wasta, like, you know, kind of karma and, and the ability to interact with them and have them actually listen to you if you actually know their language. That's fascinating. Well, you did that. Uh, did you stay for four years? Yep. Did my uh, did the four year active duty. And then after that, you went back to the University of Chicago. Got out. It was like early two thousand eight, and then I just I my mind. Well, you know, being in the service, it's just obviously way different than being in a PhD program at University of Chicago. So just slightly, I, you know, I got slightly. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like one eighty. <laughs> And, and so literally for the first three months, I just had to relearn everything because my curriculum paper had a bunch of math in it. And honestly, I couldn't even read my own paper. I was like, well, I don't even know what this person's talking about, but it was me. So I just, I just put the basics on like, hey, here, I got to relearn calculus and <laughs> all this stuff. And it is true that it is like, you know, riding a bike where, where if you know how to do it, 
if you just get you know back into it, you do quickly learn. So so yeah, reentered the program, moved back to Chicago, and you know I was in much more like in, I was in discipline mode versus a lot of my you know comrades there at the PhD program who were who were in students because I'd kind of come out with a new look on life. So I was like, I'm getting out of here in two years, and you know because usually you don't get out of the PhD program in, in a collective four years. Usually it's five, six years, but I just didn't want to mess around. So I spent three months relearning everything, and then I immediately went to work on dissertation. So, um, yeah, and because I, I, my goal was I need to get out of this place by 2010, or my wife, she, she's not going to be happy living on a ramen noodle salary for, for longer than that. And who was your mentor on your dissertation? So I so I I went back to my old curriculum paper visors and it was Thaler and Fama were the top two and then another gentleman Andrea Frazzini who's also famous now but he actually left and went to AQR so when I came back basically Frazzini had already gone to go be a you know millionaire over at AQR Thaler had gotten too famous so he obviously wasn't going to mess with PhD students anymore so really who I was left with was Fama, because he was the only link in the chain that hadn't been broken. So, so I essentially went to him, and and he was kind of like you know my core you know advisor. And then uh, an, another gentleman, Stavros Panagias, uh, he helped me a lot because I had a, a theory paper as well as part of my dissertation. Pietro Veronesi uh, was another one. So, so I had a handful of them, but but I'd say the most influential and and obviously the one that had the most experience in empirical asset pricing work was, was obviously Professor Fama. So, so he was kind of the, the one that hazed me the most, I would say, in the dissertation writing stage. Your paper, if I'm not mistaken, was about mm -hmm. active management. Yeah. So, you know, being a Marine and probably a little hard-headed, I, you know, I came back and I'd always been, like I was telling you before, a stock picker, specifically a big believer in value investing, in value investing stock picking. And so what I decided was, I want to highlight to Professor Fama that, you know, active stock picking can add value because this whole efficient market thing seems a little too crazy to me. So you're going to tell Eugene Fama, the future Nobel laureate, that he was wrong. It's at least out, that was my going in. And so what I did is like, well, how am I going to highlight this? Well, it turns out that there's, you know, this organization called Value Investors Club where a bunch of super sophisticated stock pickers, a lot of them associated with hedge funds, they would submit huge theses on basically stock pitches, right? So, you know, Best Buy is undervalued. Here's my DCF. Here's the 100 reasons why. And so what I thought is like, hey, I've been following this club since 2000. I'm a member of this club. You know, I think they add a lot of value. They seem to have really good ideas. I'm going to read every single one of these stock pitches, systematically enter them into a database, and do the quant analysis on it to then assess, hey, do these people actually add value or have quote-unquote alpha? Uh, long story short, they do at the margin. And so I submitted this uh, you know, as part of my dissertation, and somehow by the you know, grace of God, uh, you know, Fama agreed with the analysis. He had some quibbles on uh, you know, takeaways, but um, at least at the margin, I highlighted that there is some segment of the market where – you know, active stock picking might work at the margin. So that was a small victory for me. How did you meet up with uh, Jack Vogel, who you ultimately became partners with at Alpha Architect? Sure. So what happened is, is when I graduated from the program there, I went on the academic professor market. And the, also my wife was going on the academic market. She's a, a PhD in history, which is a, a way less uh, I'd say marketable profession than being a finance professor. So I went out to the market and my wife's from Philly and she needed a job as a history professor. And I ran into Drexel uh, who gave me what they call an exploding offer. So they gave me this offer. I couldn't refuse. They gave me three days to decide on it. They say, Hey, come to Philly. Your wife's from here. We'll get her a job and we'll give you the best gig ever. And we'll assign you a PhD student who will do all your dirty work. So I was like, okay, well, sign me up. You know, <laughs> what are you going to do? How, how often do you got to twist my arm? And so I entered Drexel, and then part of my package was having a dedicated research assistant, and that happened to be Jack Vogel. 
So just by circumstance and a lot of great luck, you know, I I, I just had a, a gentleman who was, you know, insanely smart, extremely well, at, or extremely good at computer programming and doing all this data analysis, and we just hit it off immediately. So we, we've been working ever since, you know, 2010 when I took that job. Well, the way I understood it was, uh, you know, Jack had read your dissertation, and he mm -hmm. said, yeah, all this is great. These These people have... Uh, alpha, they're, they're, they're outperforming the market, but I can replicate that yeah. using a computer. So are they really outperforming mm -hmm. the market? Can you tell me about that? Well, yeah. So, so that was, that was an, an insight that, that, that actually I had before I met Jack and, and kind of the takeaway from, well, the interesting takeaway from the dissertation was we, I cataloged all this data on these individual stock pickers um, and it's sure enough, they had alpha, you know, relative to, you know, pharma, French models, what have you. But essentially what they were doing for all intents and purposes was small cap value investing in a certain element of concentration. Because there's only so many ideas that they would produce. It's not like you go buy 500 names at a time. So, so there would usually be like five or six ideas a month, sometimes 10. So on a rolling basis, this portfolio would have anywhere from 50 to 100 stocks. So, but for essentially what they were doing from a quant perspective is buying smaller stocks that were super cheap, generally higher quality, and doing it in somewhat concentrated fashion. And sure enough, you could also just have a computer essentially do the same idea, right? Concentrated, small cheap quality and lo and behold it, it basically replicates what all these stock pickers were doing which it was certainly well it was kind of disheartening because at the time i was still kind of believing in stock picking because i was still being a stock picker but, but that kind of analysis there proved to me why am i banging my head against the wall so hard to you know do these dissertations on these stocks when you can essentially replicate a lot of the, you know, the, the core ideas with just using an algorithm. And so that, that was really kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say, that moved me much more heavy into just pure quant and less into, you know, think I was going to be Warren Buffett. I think the, the proof was in the numbers. And Jack Bogle, your research assistant, uh, was doing a dissertation similar to that? So Jack's dissertation was a little bit different. So what he looked at is there's a, a huge argument over whether value investing, which in defined in academic terms just means buying cheap stocks, right, on book to market or price earnings or what have you. He was looking into the argument, is this a risk-based phenomenon or is this a behavioral-based phenomenon? Where, just to explain the two ideas simply, the risk-based hypothesis essentially says that the reason cheap stocks earn higher returns is because cheapness is a proxy for fundamental risk. So the reason you're getting paid more on average is because these stocks are just fundamentally riskier. The behavioral argument, which is on the other side of the coin, is like, no, it's not because these stocks are riskier, it's because the market generally throws the baby out with the bathwater. And, and that's more related to a mispricing story that, you know, sentiment, you know, throws these names out and beats them up too bad. And so his dissertation was about how do we empirically identify whether value is risk or mispricing? And the short story is that it seems like, if anything, it's more likely mispricing versus risk that explains the value premium. It, you know, obviously this is highly debatable, but that's what his dissertation was all about. And after all of that, you decided you were going to go out and create a company together. Well, kind of. It, it actually, all this happened simultaneously, and, and it's one of the probably the crazier stories in, in our industry. So right when I actually got my job, it actually was during the time I was on the professor markets. At the time, I was writing a blog, and, and obviously my dissertation was out there. I got cold called by a very large real estate family in New York and the son had been put in charge of essentially managing, it was around $4 billion of like their liquid wealth. And they were in the middle of just living through 2008 and they were big in hedge funds, big in active management. 
and they got smoked and they're like, we're firing every one of these people. We're going to take control of our wealth. We're going to do this in house. We're going to do it with quant. We need someone to help us. And he had just been out there Googling around and somebody found me and he calls me up and he's like, Hey, can you help me manage this $4 billion? We want to use computers. I really like your dissertation. How do we do this? So went up there, met him. It, again, this is all at the same time. I'm sitting here like thinking I'm going to be a professor because I wasn't a hundred percent sure if this would actually lead to anything, but it initially kind of led to like a basic consulting gig where the gentleman said, help me for a couple of years. If you guys do a great job, you know, we'll, we'll seed your business on the asset management side. Cause, cause they had just gotten out of the whole asset management hedge fund world. And they're like, we're never going to see it or do that ever again. And then I was putting the ask on the table. So, but they said, Hey, give me two years. And so since I kind of helped them initially, and then I got Jack involved immediately because it kept scaling up bigger and bigger. And then, so after two years, in 2012, they essentially seeded $20 million in, uh, in the quantitative value strategy, which we have a book about. And then very quickly, they, they ramped it up to 50, and they put the other part in the international quantitative value. And this was all going on simultaneous to when I was being a, a professor as my day job. It just, things kept happening in the background. So it was a very hectic time, of, time in my life, I would say. And you were having children at the same time? Yeah, I, I, I was I was up to two and we were working on three <laughs> and um, yeah, it was getting crazy. And then essentially what, what what happened is after I think it was around three years into it, like this was clearly becoming a real business because we I, we're you know, managing fifty million dollar managed account. We've got like a huge consulting contract. I'm also date you know moonlight now at this point basically as a finance professor. And I was just thinking, hey, I need to go one way or the other here. And so I talked to my boss, the, the, director, the, the head of the department. I just told him, I was like, listen, I, I think I need to resign, but I don't want to screw you over here, you know, because recruiting for professors is like a total nightmare, like at least like a one year cycle. So he's like, hey, put in one more year so we can at least recruit for your position. And then you can, you know, go out into the sunset. So th that's essentially what happened. I, I, after my third year being a prof, for all intents and purposes, I was all in on the business, but I was still technically professing um, until they could recruit for my position and then, then, you know, basically kick me out the door. Uh, another interesting thing along the way is through this whole time period, it wasn't just there was large family office for whatever reason people like what we were putting out there we were just being super transparent about putting our research putting our ideas so a bunch of random rich people would call us up and say how do i do this and we'd say well we have a managed account that's how you could do it and so we kept building the business up we would do tax loss harvesting to try to minimize tax impact because everyone we we're dealing with was it was taxable money and Another thing happened along this way. Another couple hundred million uh, gentlemen out in the Midwest, we, we were working for them as well, and he had a tax problem. And it was one of these situations where he had a low basis stock that was going to get bought out by a, a large conglomerate for cash. And he was very afraid that he was going to have to incur like a huge capital gain event. So he says, go figure this out. And, you know, this is like one of these impossible things. We're like, hey, go figure out how to not pay tax. But, you know, if the rich guy says jump, you know, I say how high. And so that's what I did. I went on this mission. How am I going to deal with this problem? And I ran into a gal at a, at a bank and structured product. And this is not something you could really do anymore. But, but it, it was all related to the ETF structure. And I started learning about how the ETF structure essentially allows assets to come in at mark to market basis the etf can then dump you know any asset out even if it has low basis onto a market maker with no tax liability and it's essentially kind of a laundry mat for capital gains liabilities and this you know a light went off on my head like holy cow if i'm doing strategies that involve trading and turning over and taxes or you know essentially uncle sam's 50 percent performance fee you know, this seems like a good idea. So long story short, we, that in around 2014, we decided we were going to get into this ETF business because we thought it was a better structure to deliver these 
you know, concentrated factor portfolios than doing them in SMA with uh, tax loss harvesting. Just out of curiosity, all that work you did on the ETF mm -hmm. structure of how it, yep. with the creation and the redemption, how you can push out any unrealized gains onto the authorized participants. You had that one yeah. client in the Midwest who had this big capital gain problem, and then you had this ETF yeah. over here. I've always wondered, is there any kind of a structured product or can there be a, a structured product where you could take people who mm -hmm. have these stocks out there and put them all together yep. and bring it in and just issue them shares of an ETF and then take the stock then that they put in kind into the ETF mm -hmm. and then give it to an authorized participant to get rid of. And now the cost basis is in the ETF. Yeah. It's diversified. Is, is, so, is that possible? Yes. Yes and no. The long story short is, in the old days, yes, but what happened is all the big banks got smoked out on a bunch of tax things a few years ago, and they just cut off anything that could even be perceived as you know being on the edge because they didn't want to make Treasury angry. So my understanding from the inside baseball of talking to people that, that deal in this world is in the old days, they would actually do stuff like that for, for like super ultra high net worth clients and, you know, where they control like the, the custody and clearing pipes. But my understanding is nowadays that doesn't go on, but I certainly feel like an enterprising entrepreneur that had the time and energy to try to figure that out. It could be possible. We've looked into it from like 50 different angles and haven't been able to figure it out, but yeah, there's certainly, there's something there. I, I just haven't solved it. I, I believe there's something there too. I believe that, you know, this thing called direct indexing where you can, yep. you buy 250 or 300 stocks and then you individually sell mm -hmm. off the ones that, that are at a loss and do a tax swap. And at the end, when that's all played yep. out four or five years down the road, when there is no really longer any ability mm -hmm. to do a lot of tax swapping, you've got this portfolio of 200, 300 stocks that have, a yeah. bunch of low cost basis, but that looks an awful yeah. lot like an index. So yeah. if you could just take that and just turn that into an ETF provider and get shares yeah. of a more diversified ETF where the cost basis of the ETF is the cost basis of all your mm -hmm. stocks in aggregate, but it's a lot more easy to manage one security than 400. Yeah. So I, yeah, I agree hundred um, percent. And, and I get in fights all the time with people arguing over you do you do the etf structure or do you do the tax loss harvesting structures and you know it's it's kind of i still believe there's a marginal benefit like even if you're doing pure passive like say for example like the parametric solution like s p with tax loss harvesting or just go by the vanguard fund i still believe that the vanguard fund is better because a lot of people also forget and to your point that eventually you get basis and everything but the index changes, like firms get bought out for cash. Guess what? You can deal with that problem in an ETF structure. You can't if you own it's no security, right? Like if you have low basis and, you know, Joe Blow wants to buy the company out for cash, you're going to eat tax liability. That's mm -hmm. easy to cleanse in an ETF. So I think, and then there's the fee differential. Like those tax loss harvesting solutions are, you know, 20, 30, 40 BIPs you know, an S&P 500 ETF is basically zero. So if you annuitize that cost differential over, you know, the life of the investment, you know, the lump sum of that's maybe two, 3% of your wealth. Like, does that make sense? Probably not. Um, is, you know, is that the value of the tax loss shield you're going to get? I don't think so. So I, I, I think tax loss harvesting and direct indexing is total hype overblown versus, just buying the passive index through an ETF structure for zero. That, that seems like a better long-term solution to me, but yeah, you know, I agree. reasonable I agree with people that. can disagree. Let's move on a little bit. So all of a sudden you decide you're going to launch Alpha Architect and you open up yeah. the, the world headquarters, which I've been to several times now. Yeah, for sure. So, so the original world headquarters was in a little house I had in New Jersey um, but that was five minutes from my mother-in-law. So both my wife and I agreed that, Hey, we should probably move a little bit further away. So we moved over here to the Pennsylvania side and I, at the, I'd spent a year 
doing a commute from Baltimore to Philly when I was first year as a professor there because we still had a place down there. And, and you know, I came out of the service. I swore off commuting because I actually wanted to hang out with my kids. I like exercising. So I said, you know what? I'm going to set up a business in my house. And if people don't like it, like, that's fine. But it's good for my mental, physical health. It's going to make me operate more efficiently. Um, why not? And so we, we bought this place out in Pennsylvania. It's, it's kind of a compound of sorts. Um, and now it's, you know, Alpha Architect Global Headquarters. But yeah, essentially we we just built an office inside this residence, you know, got it zoned and everything. And, you know, we start off with obviously no AUM hardly at all. And, you know, now we're have almost a billion, but, you know, it, it functionally achieves the goal. We, we, it keeps our costs down low and it keeps commuting time down. So we, we're <laughs> we kind of stuck with it. So it's a bit awkward, but in the, in the world of, you know, 0% management fees, you got to do weird things <laughs> sometimes. And understand some interesting artifacts went along with that house. Yeah. So, so we got this place from a big game hunter who was uh, basically had a, it was a tragic situation. He had pancreatic cancer and he was basically going to die in three months. So it was kind of a, a liquidation opportunity of some sort, both the house and our uh, friends we have. He, he was, a, like I said, a big game hunter. So we acquired a grizzly bear, a leopard, and a bunch of other really cool taxidermy mounts, and uh, one of which we keep in the office, the, the grizzly bear, because we like to say that uh, you know we try to kill bear markets. Uh, and we have evidence of it by having our grizzly bear here. So we, it's definitely a unique experience uh, visiting Alpha Architect headquarters. It, it was for me because when the first time I went to visit you, I'm, I'm driving down this residential street and I'm saying, this can't be it. And yeah, we've had um, many of very, very wealthy people and, and a lot of famous folks roll through here with that exact same expression. <laughs> What in the world did this guy talk me into? Why am I hanging out in a residence in the suburbs of Philadelphia? Is this person crazy or what? So things have gone well. You've uh, launched several ETFs, and the way in which you do ETF and factor investing, I find it to be kind of the right way of doing it. It's almost like the next generation of mm -hmm. factor investing because it's so deep and so concentrated that if you want to do factor investing that it seems to me you should be paying for as much exposure to these factors in a in a concentrated form as you can get so it, it appealed to me right away when i found out you know how you were doing it yeah so essentially the the, the genesis of this idea is when we were working for the family office, they were going to do the typical thing where they're like, let's go buy our cheap data, but then we need to figure out how to replicate a lot of these different exposures that we used to get from these hedge fund people. And hedge funds obviously aren't doing like cheap beta stuff. They're usually doing concentrated bets in, you know, with, with stock picking, but what essentially is factors like small value quality, but they're doing it a much more, focused way. Um, so we naturally thought, well, if we want to replicate these more unique exposures out there, we need to replicate them how they need to be replicated. And that means we're going to do maybe factors, but we're not going to hold 500 securities and, and focus so much on how, how close this tracks the index. We're going to do 50 stock portfolios and just tell people up front that this is not a closet index with a little tilt to like the value factor. This is pure value where we're literally buying the cheapest, you know, 40 or 50 securities on, you know, our, you know, a different metric. We use enterprise multiples, but to keep it simple, like PE ratio. Um, so yeah, and, and that's just what we did. And we just told people up front of the downside, which is of course the tracking error and the relative performance that this stuff can bounce around both good and bad. Uh, you know, over long time periods, and you should just be prepared for that. It's not the Vanguard fund. And we just wanted to deliver it, you know, transparently, affordably, and be very upfront about the potential pain associated with this style of investing. And I think that's all very interesting. Let's say that you want to 
have a slice of your portfolio to mm -hmm. additional risk factors. And the reason yeah. I use additional risk factors is because I actually mm -hmm. interviewed Gene Fama one time, and I said, yep. you know, if beta beta is a factor, so what do you call these other things? Do you call them um, smart beta? Do you call them uh, what, what do you call them? And he, his answer was, they are additional risk factors, so they are additional betas. I said, okay, yep. so let's say you wanted exposure to something other than beta. I guess you could do it by going long short, yep. correct? But that would be expensive yep. in many ways. Yep. So you're going yeah. long only, but you're doing it very yeah. concentrated and you're keeping the cost down. Yes, that's right. So you, you got it. So so the concept, to, to Professor Farmer's point, in, in our, our portfolios are, are constructed in a way that is much more akin to how kind of academics form portfolios. And that's what all the evidence shows, like look how great they are. Um, the idea is we're not going to go long short to your point because it's much more expensive to run, operate, and just access those exposures. And so, it, and so we're going to stick on the long side, but it's not going to be broad market beta exposure. It's going to be some beta, obviously, because it's long only, but we're going to focus as much as we can on capturing, you know, the value risk premia or the momentum risk premia. And again, it's very important for us to communicate this element that this is a risk premia and this is very different because frankly, the biggest issue with doing different risk is that they're different than what a lot of people see on the news channel, like on the SP 500. And if they're not mentally prepared for that, you know, they're oftentimes going to be in at the wrong time, out at the wrong time and kind of ruin the whole reason for holding additional risk premium, which is to help your long, long term performance and to kind of diversify away from just owning generic beta. Uh, you, you and I went back and forth on Twitter a little bit about what, mm -hmm. what does the word sure. long term holding mean? You know, how long is yeah. lo how long is long? And I think I said yeah. a lifetime, and I, you said no, it's only twenty years. Uh, and I said, okay, we'll, co <laughs> we'll compromise at twenty-five years. But you know, th this idea of holding these factors for a long, yep. long time is really critical to the success of an investor. Yeah, it's it's just the the advice from uh, Bogles is, is actually timeless, and it applies everywhere. Like when he talks about holding you know, equity, he doesn't suggest you should go buy the S&P 500 fund or VT or VTI and just, you know, trade it every year. He's like, no, this is like basically your permanent holding because you want to capture the equity risk premium. Well, same thing here. We're trying to capture, you know, some specific factor risk premium and the same advice applies. You're not going to capture it by trying to time it day trade it, you know, bounce around all over the place. You've got to hold the thing and actually earn the associated risk premium with it, which means you need to look at it more as a long-term strategic holding and not as a, you know, kind of a short-term trading vehicle because that's not what it's really designed for. So let's get down to the, the nitty gritty then, the bottom line on all this. It, it's going to cost me more mm -hmm. money to go after those additional betas because they have to pay a fee every year uh, that's yep. higher than the basically beta is free now. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. anything other than beta, which is now free out there, I'm going to yep. decide to add additional betas or additional factors to my portfolio uh, using, yeah. using your funds. But your funds are not free. Your funds have no. cost. So number one, yep. I have to get over that hurdle rate of the cost. Yeah. And yep. there's, a, there's a thing out there called a, uh, where we talk about it as a alpha decay or a uh, mm -hmm. premium decay that's going on. As more and more people are doing what you're doing, there yeah. seems to be a decay going on as to the expected return from these mm -hmm. additional factors. Can you yeah. uh, can you see that? Have you measured it? To, are are your funds going to produce? Mm -hmm. Because I have to take money out of beta to put it into the additional factors. They have to yeah. literally, yep. it's long only. So I'm taking a slice of my total market index fund and I'm going to allocate yeah. it to your fund and I'm going to pay yep. you a higher fee. And yeah. I need to at least get beta, which I know I'm going to mm -hmm. get in the market. Yeah. But I got to get above and beyond that. Is it worth mm -hmm. it? 
So, yeah, so that, that there's a lot of questions in there, and it's all about uh, costs and benefits. So, in general, when you look at any of these uh, sort of factors, like the cheaper you can get them, the better, right? And a lot of times the price is going to be associated with the scarcity of said factor. If, if something has massive, insane capacity, well, at the margin, that's something that Vanguard can deliver at scale. An example of a factor like that might be market beta, right? That's obviously something that has trillions of dollars of capacity. You can jam tons of money into it. Not, not infinite amount of money, by the way, but you know, in general, that would make sense. But then there's other sort of strategies where if you're actually going to do the actual factor, like for example, like what we do, 40 stocks, you know, mid cap, a lot of times small cap weight, like you just can't jam a trillion dollars into that strategy, right? So there's going to be a natural limit on capacity, which means you can't just scale it to infinity, which means the cost can't be free because you got to pay the fixed costs and the bills and the operational things for running this damn thing, right? So, so that's just kind of the economics of general capturing any exposure that doesn't have infinite scale. The second question relates to, well, what do these premiums actually deliver? So, for example, value, let's say. And, and you could do value investing, just generically, let's just call it low PE investing. You could do it one of two ways. We'll just make up. One way is you could go buy a, a portfolio of, say, 40 stocks that have low PE. Another way is you could go and wait. You could go take the SP 500 stocks and kind of tilt more weight towards the low PE, less weight to the high PE. But on net, you're basically not really doing much. You're kind of tilting one way or the other. So clearly, the potential value add from the so-called value factor is going to be a lot higher in the concentrated one than in the diluted one. So that's one element, like how's the thing constructed? But then the other important element is, is this premium going to pay off in the first place? Because if let's just say value just doesn't work at all, well, then if I have it in a concentrated format or have it in a diluted format, it's not going to do anything for me. And that gets back to the question of, well, why does a factor pay off in the first place? And because it's an open secret and because a lot of people know about it and because a lot of people are perceived to be doing it, will that make it decay? Well, why that that's we got to step back and say, why do these things get why did they pay off in historical sense? Well, value generally paid off because to Fama's point, it's riskier. So unless you were to believe that risk preferences have changed, then one would probably want to believe that exposure to the value factor will probably pay off at some point in the future. Clearly, it hasn't paid off very well in the last five or 10 years, but just like generic market beta doesn't pay off all the time, you know, it's had 10, 20 year droughts as well. There's a reason to believe from an economic perspective that value will pay off just because a lot of times it's fundamentally riskier. And then the second point is that if someone is going to do value, and you believe even in the mispricing component of value, like they, people throw the baby out with the bathwater, there's this aspect of what they call career risk. So just because everyone knows about something doesn't mean they may go and do it, because if you go out and buy concentrated portfolios of value stocks, like right now, it's very likely that you have a high probability of getting fired, because these things can bounce all over the place, you know, you're going to get destroyed by the S&P 500 sometimes and people think you're an idiot and you get booted out of the, you know, the job. So this creates its own what we call career risk premium. So to the extent that, you know, a lot of people are, quote unquote, doing these things, but these strategies earn premiums for a reason, i.e. they're risky and they stink to do, one would expect that over the long haul, they're probably going to earn some premium. Um, I don't know what that will be. Um, you know, historically, like a concentrated value portfolio, like, like what we're doing, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe three to 4% over like a generic index, which is going to be being sourced from being smaller, being cheaper, 
uh, you know, for the most part. Let's say that cuts in half to 2%, right? Because at the margin, it gets more efficient. That So you may earn this 2% premium, but this is not like an arbitrage. This means you're going to deal with probably more risk, probably more vol, probably will definitely way more pain and anguish in a relative sense to like common benchmarks. So you're probably going to earn this return. But then the question is, well, how much does it cost me to access this 2% premium? Well, if it costs me 200 bips, that's probably a bad idea. If it costs me, you know, zero, that'd be a great idea, right? And then, and then there's somewhere in between. So what, what we do is like on, on our stuff, we, you know, for the domestics, we charge uh, 49 basis points. So just under 50 bips, which is obviously way more expensive than zero. I wouldn't call it outrageous, but the idea is we're the bet on our stuff would be, hey, over the next 20 years, do I believe that the excess return associated with the factor exposures that I'm getting here are in excess of 49 basis points? If not, then why would I do this? Um, if so, okay, I might want to do this. But then the second question would be, well, can someone else deliver it even cheaper? Because maybe Vanguard's got some concentrated value factor fund for 30 bips, right? And the process is very similar and I like it. Well, okay, I think I project it's worth 1%, you know, over the long haul or 2%. It only costs me 30 bips here. I'll go do that one, right? So, so it just, it comes down to the trade-off between what do you expect this premium to pay off over the long haul? What do I got to pay for it? And obviously you'd, you you want to pay less and earn more as best you can, which is what I argue a lot of these people that do factor investing are doing today. They're not <laughs> buying and holding, you know, our funds for 20 years. They're like day trading, you know, the iShares factor funds. That that's not that's not arbitraging <laughs> factor premiums. That's that's in the end cr- probably contributing to make them even higher in the future. But that's a that's a different speed dating, debate. Speed, speed dating factor funds rather than marrying one. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the, the only way you can pull premium out of the market is you need to have massive amounts of permanent capital sticking in something because it's kind of taking supply off the market. But if all you got is more day traders, you know, throwing money around, sloshing around in factors, that's not arbitraging away the factor. That's just money sloshing around and, and it's adding volatility to the factor. But unless that money is like all mini Warren Buffett's, you know, holding for 20 years, through thick and thin, it's not going to depress the risk premium associated with them, or it'd be very unlikely to do so. And I frankly don't see that sort of mentality amongst factor investors in the in the marketplace. N- nor do I see that as an incentive for product manufacturers because they're they're in the business of of activity. So the more I can get you to like day trade them, do this, that, and the other other thing, that's that's good for the business out there. So I, I think. People have an incentive to promote activity in factors. And you've written a lot about this. You've got three books out there, uh, numerous papers. The books are Quantitative Value, Quantitative Momentum, and then Mm -hmm. DIY, Do-It-Yourself Financial Advisor. I've read the book, and it's not as easy as... I I think you make it out to be in that book, how you can do all of this as a do-it-yourself investor, but... (laughs) Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I, I would say it's just like on Boglehead. You can go review the start here. Here's how it's done. And yeah, you can read it and there's the cookbook. But at the right price, sometimes people will still be like, you know what? Thanks. I really appreciate the transparency. I understand what you're going to do, but I have better uses for my time. And I'd rather pay you to do this for me. So, <laughs> But there are people that definitely are DIY, but there's certainly a lot of people, you know, like my grandma, for example, where you know, she's probably she's probably not uh, well suited to DIY, even if she read the book and thought it was cool because her grandson wrote it. Well, we're so a bit up, of a misnomer on the title. We're coming up on the on the end of our time. Uh, I'd just like to switch gears here for one last second. Could you talk about your March for the Fallen and what that's all about? Yeah, so March for the Fallen is a 28 mile march held at the Pennsylvania National Guard training unit and the the idea here is you're out there representing 
for, on behalf of, of those who lost loved ones in the military. So we're, we're supporting Gold Star families and people who have lost people in war. And it, it's not a charity in the sense that you give money. It's a charity in the sense that people that have lost their loved ones like to know that other people are, are remembering and honoring the fallen. So that's what you do. You're out there in your charities, kind of your blood, sweat, and tears to represent and um, you know let them know that that we still appreciate you know sacrifices they gave as a family. And so you go out there and hang out, and it's a great cause, and you meet a lot of great people. And I really enjoy you know promoting it and trying to encourage as many folks as possible to come out. And if somebody was interested in joining your group, you you've got a pretty large group that you've put together. Yep. So you got, so last year we had around 150. Uh, this year, I imagine we'll have probably 200 plus. Uh, all you got to do if, if you want to be on notifications, obviously just reach out direct or just, if you go to alpharchitect.com slash MFTF, there's a whole website about training plans, nutrition, how to sign up and all, and all these sort of other things. Um, and all you got to do is just show up. We take care of lodging and chow and I think it's like 35 bucks you got to pay to the National Guard. So it's very low cost, uh, super efficient, great cause. You meet a bunch of great people. And I think everyone should at least do it one time in their life. Well, thank you, Wes. It's been a, a great conversation. I really appreciate you joining us here on Bogleheads on Investing. You got it. It's been an honor. And uh, keep doing what you guys do over at Bogleheads. I love the education and, and, and love the uh, effort for DIY investors out there. This concludes the ninth episode of Bogleheads on Investing. I'm your host, Rick Ferry. Join us each month to hear a new special guest. In the meantime, visit Bogleheads.org and the Bogleheads Wiki. Participate in the forum and help others find the forum. Thanks for listening. 